words with the sounding brass and the tinkling cymbals. So I'm praying that you would hide me behind your cross and speak through me. Adjust what you want to adjust. Say what you want to say. And Lord, you just use me as an instrument, play whatever key you want to play through me that your people need to hear. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. amen. And Amen. Out of 140 films, 83 of them were country westerns. He also played every role in the genre. There was the cowboy, uh, the lone ranger, the cavalry man. And the list goes on and on. In fact, John Wayne became so synonymous with country western movies that it literally got to the point that actually Joseph Stalin, who was at the time the dictator of Russia, put out a hit on John Wayne. Because not only was John Wayne a country western star, but he was also known as the quintessential American hero. And he was very anti-communist. And actually the hit was not only, it was not only put out on him, but he actually sent out some henchmen to actually make sure that it came about. Had it not been for the fact that Joseph Stalin died just a few months later, they would have probably tried to kill John Wayne. Nikita Khrushchev actually met John Wayne later on and he told him about the hit that it actually put out on him. But he started off uh, initially being born in Iowa, Marion Robert Morrison, and he finally moved with his family to Glendale, California, and he went to the University of Southern California where he played football. But finally he broke his collarbone during a body surfing accident. And as a result of this body surfing accident, he could not play and he lost his scholarship to the University of Southern California. But his coach, Howard Jones, had some Hollywood bigwigs that were friends of his. And so they were able to get John Wayne a job working on the Hollywood lot of Fox Film Corporation. Now, he was only working there, actually, as like one of those people who would carry stuff, and he actually was carrying tables. But many people, the directors, began to notice, notice him because the guy was six foot four, very hulking guy, and so they said, we could probably use him in movies. And so that was where John Wayne got his start, and he became the top box office draw for probably the next 20 or 30 years. In fact, Actually, he sold more tickets to his particular films than almost anybody else except for Clark Gable. A Hollywood legend, unrivaled in his era, John Wayne became literally a revered symbol of the rugged American West, and his singular voice is probably known by millions even to this day. You know, I'm John Wayne. You know, John Wayne. He was even awarded, he was even awarded two of the highest civilian awards that could be given to a particular person. While he was alive, he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 1979, and then the year after he died, that same year, he got the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But in spite of all of his sterling performances as an actor with a career spanning over five decades, one of the concerning observations I noticed about Wayne's career was that after a while, he got typecast. He got typecast. Fox Film Corporation, seeing that they could make tons of money off of John Wayne serving solely in country westerns, began to typecast him, and that was the only part that he ended up ever playing. He, said, he got signed to do the same role, and he ended up, hear me now, he ended up getting stereotyped as a cowboy. But sadly, friends, John Wayne is not the only one who has been typecast in this world. Black and Latino women have been typecast for centuries by a world that has tried to dictate their roles for them. You don't know I'm telling the truth. And, and in fact, in a book entitled The Sisters Are All, are All Right, 
changing the broken narrative of black women in America, Tamara Winfrey Harris listed four stereotypes that were thrust upon black women, and many people still believe in these stereotypes to this day. Actually, you all actually might, might want to take notes. The first stereotype of black women is the mammy. Write that down, the mammy. The second stereotype of black women is as the sapphire. The sapphire. The third stereotype of black women is the Jezebel. And the fourth stereotype about black women is the matriarch. Now, now let me unpack these. Let me unpack these four stereotypes and share what she might, what she meant by actually talking about these. Let's start off with the mammy, the black mammy. What's the black man, mammy? The quintessential black mammy was found on the movie Gone with the Wind in 1939, played by Hattie McDaniels. You all remember that? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever seen Gone with the Wind? Mm -hmm. Hattie McDaniels was, and I'm not saying this to say that she was not beautiful, but she was overweight. Am, am I right? She was overweight. She was uh, not considered to be the most attractive a woman. Not only that, friends, but she had no self-worth and no ambition. Her greatest joy was solely in taking care, excuse me, taking care of the family that she worked for, and she was never taken too seriously or given any other respect other than that which would, be, would have been accorded to a grandmotherly figure to the people's children. Am I right? Y'all remember that? She was disrespected. She was looked down upon. She was not really held in too high esteem. It's as though almost she was almost on the, on the level of a family pet. Yeah. It's the black man. Yeah. Black man. In fact, actually, it's interesting because if, if you look at who won, if I, I don't know if she won the Oscar for it, but even you would think that that whole entire thing has actually gone out the window. But she was the first, number one, she was the first woman ever, black woman, to ever win an Oscar. Wasn't she Hattie McDaniels? But the NAACP actually had an outcry against it because they felt like, what are you doing playing this part? She said, she said, I'd rather play a mammy in a movie than to play a mammy in real life. But then interestingly enough, just a few years ago, another movie came out named what? The Help. And The Help, and did, did she not win another Oscar for that particular movie? For playing almost the exact same role, a mammy. Now, 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 what about the sapphire woman? I'm, I'm just starting off. Follow along. With, I, mean, I hope you all are writing notes. The sapphire woman. The sapphire woman was hard, loud, and emasculating to men. During slavery, she was forced to work right beside the men in the field, making her tough, unfeeling, and somewhat overbearing. And, and, and she became the forerunner of the angry black woman stereotype of the 21st century. She also became the forerunner of the black superwoman stereotype, which was another branch that emanated from the sapphire woman, and, and that was epitomized by Carrie Washington in the show Scandal. Anybody watch the show, show Scandal? You remember Scandal, how in, in, in the show Scandal, she could essentially fix everything. Am I right? And nobody dared to stand up against Kerry Washington or Olivia Pope, even including the president, because she was going to make sure you got put back into your what? Into your place. You all remember that? Yeah. And then, after the Sapphire Woman, the next one was the Jezebel Woman, which is obviously pretty self-explanatory. Over-sexualized and underclothed. This stereotype about black women had its foundations, at least in, in part, as far back as the slave trade. You see, because the black women actually who were forced to actually be on these ships because they came from a warmer climate, they didn't have all the clothing that their Caucasian counterparts had. Isn't that right? So as a result, many times, it was actually, and these European men actually had some pretty demented minds, so they actually began to use these women for whatever particular carnal cravings that they might have. In fact, they didn't just actually go on through slavery times, but even after the Emancipation Proclamation, it continued through segregation times. And the sad reality is, is that while the white woman actually had the right to protest and actually somebody might go to jail for actually molesting or raping her, the black woman, it was assumed, wanted it. And as a result, there was no laws against that black 
woman actually being raped, sexually assaulted, or molested. And many times, friends, they would be looked down, down upon as the bad person, even though they were actually the victims. In fact, there's an actual system that actually came out of that right here in Pensacola. And all, all along the Gulf Coast, there's a movie actually which Vanessa Williams played in. And actually, I think it was called The Courage to Love or something like that. And it actually talks about the system called Placage. Anybody ever heard of Plus Age? Plus Age was the system in which the, uh, the, the black woman would essentially be a mistress, and it would be called a left-handed marriage. And this left-handed marriage meant that this white guy would have essentially two families. He'd have his legal family, and then he'd have his illegal family by this black woman. And this stuff continued on and on and on, but many times these women were the victims of rape, and they could not say anything. And it was sad because many times they became actually essentially typecast into that particular situation. Finally, there was the matriarch. The matriarch. You all heard of the matriarch, haven't you? The matriarch was essentially the head of the household. She kind of was in the same area as the sapphire. Her husband was either henpecked or she had no husband at all. And as a result, this woman was forced to take on more of a masculine dominant position than she should have. In many instances, she would actually have to fight and beat up the men, including her own husband. Now, I confess, I actually have some relatives like that. <laughs> I never forget my grandmother telling me about this particular relative, and I won't name who she is. It wasn't my grandmother, just so you know. Praise the Lord. But she told me about this relative. It was a lady who actually, her husband was so scared of her. Her husband was so scared of her that when she was in the kitchen and she had knives, she was just cutting some meat. He would run out of the kitchen. Because <laughs> he was scared to death. Because she ruled the roost in that household. And some of y'all, let's be honest, y'all know that stuff is real. These, stere these stereotypical roles were thrust upon women of African descent for centuries. And sadly, the world still tries to typecast black, black women into these same roles today. And you'll, you'll remember in 2008 when Michelle Obama made the simple statement, for the first time in my adult life, I'm really proud of my country. Not just because Barack is doing well, but I think people are hungry for change. You all remember that when she made that statement? And they labeled her as an angry black woman. You all remember that? She even actually had to, she even wrote in her, in her, um, her book, she said, it was important to tell that part of the story because they see me in Barack now, but they don't know how many punches it took us to get there. People from all sides, Democrats and Republicans, tried to take me out by the knees, and the best way they could do it was to focus on the strength of the black woman, so they turned that into a caricature. For a minute there, I was an angry black woman who was emasculating her husband. I had to prove that not only was I smart and strategic, but I had to work harder than any first lady in history. She said, essentially, they tried to typecast me. Follow along. My only, my only issue, though, my, my issue is not so much with the fact that the world has tried to typecast black women. That's not my issue. My issue... Because first of all, before I actually go on to my issue, my issue is not with that because the reality is, is that this is a sinful world and sinners are going to do what sinners do, including typecasting black women. Isn't that right? That's not my issue. My issue is with the fact that numerous African-American women and black women in general have accepted the roles that the world has given to them. I hope I... I hope I didn't actually offend anybody. Did you hear what I just said? My issue is with, that, with the fact that many African black women have accepted the role that has been given to them. What do you mean? You know, I'm not talking about a film in Hollywood. I'm talking about the stereotypical role that the world has given black women in this life. We've got too many black women who have accepted the role of a mammy. What do I mean? You've looked in the mirror. And you essentially said, I'm not that attractive. 
I'm not that pretty. You've accepted the lie that your life was not important. You've accepted the lie that all you were supposed to do in life is serve and care for others. You've accepted the lie that you were dumb and your opinions don't matter. And you don't deserve any more education after high school. And then you became a mammy. You've accepted the, you've accepted the fact, or the lie, excuse me, that your life and existence is only important as it relates to taking care of somebody else. You've got that Martha syndrome. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 10. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 10. You've got the Martha syndrome. Luke, cha Luke chapter 10. Look the Bible says in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Say amen if you're there. Now, I know that's going fast. Luke, the 10th chapter. I'll, bet I'll wait for a few minutes. Luke chapter 10, and verse number 38. You are that mammy, and you've got that Martha syndrome. Luke chapter 10, and verse number 38. Here's what the Bible says. It says this. Now, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, which also did what? Sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was comfort about much what? Serving. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away. Martha was too busy cooking and cleaning and taking care of the house that she was not, she was ceasing to be fed spiritually herself. She was too busy doing something all the time for somebody else. She was always taking care of somebody else and she was not taking care of herself. Martha, or that mammy, is that person who works 60 to 80 hours as a nurse, but they never take any time to do any exercise and self care. And the mammy, friends, it's not necessarily working in the white person's house, but you're that overworked grandmother who constantly looks after your grandkids, even though you have some children, and those children are the ones who bore those kids, and they ought to take care of those kids themselves. And you never take any time for yourself because you're always concerned about somebody else. You're that mammy, friends. I'm, I'm bringing it even closer home. And all you do every time you come to church is you feel you have to take care of the food in the back. And at the same time, you many times are not being spiritually fed and you're not even getting strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You're too busy always taking care of somebody. Else. Sometimes you ought to forget the food. And you ought to say, I'm getting into church because I need the gospel myself, friends. If you're too busy taking care of everybody else's needs, then you are a mammy. And some mammies need to sit down and, and, and say, you know what? Forget them. I need to take care of me because the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love who? Yourself. But if you don't love yourself, then how can you truly love your neighbor? Many people don't even love themselves. They got the, the mammy condition. They feel they're ugly. They feel they're, 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 they're not worth anything. They feel their life is meaningless. They feel that all I should be doing in life is taking care of somebody else. Friends, you need to stop. If that's, who, if that's who you are, you ought to say, you know what? I need to take an inventory of my life. Because many a black woman still has actually, has actually accepted that typecast role of a mammy. Your grandchildren are like, you know what? And you know that grandchild ought to actually, uh, excuse me, that child of yours ought to be taking care of their own kids. But you're like, sure, honey, you can go out and do what you want. I'll look after the kids. Sometimes you ought to say no. You look after your own kids. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Sometimes, friends, you ought to say no. I'm not going to work extra hours. Because I'm getting out of shape, I'm getting fat, I'm getting unhealthy, and my, you know, can I just be, I, you know, this is being recorded, I'm just going to state a fact. I'm talking about my own family. My mom died of breast cancer. But my mom, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just being honest, this is extremely transparent, but my mom was overweight. And I mean, that could have had a whole, there, there could have been a whole lot of factors in that. But part of it was, I really believe, the fact was that she was working many times double shifts, 
through the night, and many times she didn't have that much time for self-care. Self-care. Yes. Mammies don't think about anybody. They never, excuse me, think about themselves. I got to take care of this person and that person and the other person and the other person and the other person. What about taking care of you? But we also got too many black women that have accepted the role of a sapphire woman as well. Can't even talk to them without it actually leading into an argument. How you doing? What you want? Get out of my face. You know I'm telling the truth. It seems like they're actually during that. Well, anyway, I won't go there. It seems, some of y'all, some of y'all, some of y'all have actually seen Real Housewives of Atlanta. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all see love, love and hip hop. Absolutely. Y'all see love and hip hop, and the list goes on and on. Now, now we we all know that many of those shows are just fake drama, but the reality is is that many of those shows are based off of reality. I never will forget. I was actually doing a Bible study. Now, now shocking, it's not just is this not just something that's just solely in the black community? Because <laughs> this is in many communities. But I remember actually, I was. I was actually, I was doing a Bible study. I was, I was visiting a particular family. And this lady was up into the man's face. She was up in her, and she, I, if I'm not mistaken, she had her hand on his head. She's like, look, brother, da 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 Jump off. And I was like, I'm not, hey, I'm not. <laughs> hey, I ain't trying to, you know, look, I didn't do nothing, sister. I'm innocent. But she was up in his face. She's like, you ain't doing nothing. Such and such and so and so and such and such and so and so. And I felt sorry for the poor, the poor dude, you know. Uh, uh, but I couldn't say nothing. <laughs> I, I don't want her to turn her wrath on me. <laughs> I'm not just talking about Gail King and her interview to awards Lisa Leslie. But you know what I really, be I really believe? I believe, in, and you all are going to hate me, sisters, for what I'm about to say. But I believe that there are some sisters who despise and look down on their African American brothers. And you all may you may, you may hate me for saying this, but I really believe I, maybe I'm wrong. And this even goes for the Latino community too. <laughs> but I really the reason I say that the reason I say that is, and, and, I, and I don't know what it might have been born, but maybe it actually came from the fact. That historically, many times the black man may not have been there. So maybe their father wasn't there when he should have been. Or maybe that particular husband or boyfriend that they had left them just when they had a child and decided to find some other girl. And as a result, friends, they take it out many times on many times other, other black men. And you actually wonder, what is wrong with you? This one, one for, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say where, but many times it's even in the church. Am I, am, I, am I talking to something? Now praise the Lord, this church isn't like that. We don't have no, we have no sisters like that in here. But you know, you, you, you get on somebody, you get on certain sisters. You know what the Bible says? I'm giving you some scripture. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 24. Proverbs chapter 25, I'm just giving you some scripture for this one. Talking to the sisters. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 24. And I, I want somebody else to read this scripture for me. Somebody read it for me. Go ahead and read it, Tyra. No, amen, amen. <laughs> Did you want to say it's better to do what? Dwell in the corner of the housetop. Then with a what? A brawling woman. And then a what? Wow. Oh, that was strong. Now, Solomon had a thousand wives, so I think he knew what he was talking about. But the reality is, is that, you, you know, certain men, and, and, and brothers, don't show, your, don't show your emotions. I don't want you to get in trouble here. But certain men, you feel sorry for them. And you thank the Lord you didn't have to go home with the same lady. So you're like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my wife. Thank you, Lord, for my wife, Rochelle. <laughs> I'm so glad. But I'm just being honest, friends. I mean, you, and, and you know what? 
it's a stereotype and it's not true, but the reality is, is that many black men and many times many other men have been turned off because many sisters have accepted the typecast role that has been given to them of being that angry black woman. You know I'm telling the truth. Thank you so much. Uh, Sister Lee is giving me a look. I'm, I don't want to get in trouble with You just, I mean, let me let me let me just be more let me be more practical. I was at this one particular place. I hadn't even been there that long. I didn't even know these people well. But this this one particular sister proceeded to I mean you're attack me. No, not physically, you know, because I wouldn't know I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but she proceeded to, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't hit no girl. But I mean, but this this lady proceeded to, like, in such and such and so and so, I don't want to give it out, no, and it's not, it wasn't here, just so you know, one year. But she was like, in such and such and so and so. And you were like, what in the world was up with that lady? I don't know you like that. <laughs> but, but, but guess what happened later on, I found out. I found out that her child's father was in prison. And I found out that her own father had not even truly been there for her either. So perhaps behind the anger towards me was a man that had not done his job. And the reality is, friends, sisters, brothers, that many times many brothers have played a role in the sisters accepting the role of being an angry black woman. And we're complicit. We gotta actually stop being complicit in making our sisters angry. Lastly, and I, and I'm gonna I'm not even gonna talk about the, about the matriarch, but we've got too many black women who accepted the typecast role of a Jezebel. Now, I know I'm touching on some toes. People may hate me for this. But, you know, you got, obviously, you know, you got the Beyonce's and you got the Rihanna's. I like to call it Rihanna, but it's Rihanna. Rihanna, you got the Nicki Minaj's, you've got the Mariah Carey's, you got the Black Chinas, you got the Amber Roses, you got all these young ladies who actually have accepted the Jezebel role. And that's one thing. That's the, that's the, that's the media. That's the, um, you know, the public. But it's another thing when it's local girls, i.e. church girls, who've accepted the Jezebel typecast role. What do you mean? We live in a social media age. Am I right? Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. And what's so bad about the social media age is that many times people feel like they ought to broadcast wherever they're at on social media. Am I right? So then many church girls broadcast that they weren't always being churchy. Can I get an amen on that? They weren't at church that one particular day. They were at another place. And you're wondering, and, and, and they're letting you know that the, at that particular time, they're not acting like Mary, the mother of Jesus. <laughs> they're acting like somebody else at that, particular, at, at, at that particular place. And many times, what's even worse, is many times when the young ladies, and I'm not trying to bash, but many even young time, excuse me, young ladies in the church bring that Jezebel typecast role with them to church. I know I'm offending some people, but hey, that's that's reality. They dress in a certain way to show more than it should be shown. Showing some things that only their husband ought to see. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Oh, my God, I got one right there. <laughs> and many times, he said, he said, he said, I got to they don't just, they don't just come and sit in the back row. They sit down here in the front row. 
You know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? And you almost want to take a, you almost want to get the sisters. Ask the sisters, can we get a little sheet? <laughs> Am I right? Because we've got some young ladies who accept, accept, excuse me, the typecast role of being a Jezebel. What I found out, though, is interesting is, though, is that all these things work hand in hand. You know, actually, before I even go into that part, I want to actually talk a little bit more about this Jezebel. You know, I was reading about, actually, at the All-Star game. You know, they just had the All-Star game on Sunday, didn't they? They had the All-Star game on Sunday. I think the West won by two points. But do you know that there is young ladies, sisters many times, who will save up money throughout the entire year. They will literally save money up through the entire year just so that they can buy a hotel room right close by where the actual NBA All-Star game is going on. And they will actually buy that hotel room right there, and they'll have a hotel room right in the hotel where the players are at. You know why? Because they know if I can get pregnant by a basketball player, I'm set for life. There's a name for him. You know the name. What's that name called? It's called a groupie. You've heard of those groupies? You might have heard of groupies. Jezebels. They've accepted the typecast role. So, so my question is this. My, my question is this. How can we fix this issue? You know what the Lord hit me with? The reason that John Wayne continued to be typecast is because he continued to work for the same studio. As long as he continued to work for Fox Film Corporation, they knew that they were going to make money as long as he continued to play a country western star. But had he gone to a different studio, he might have been able to say, you know what, I don't want to actually play this particular country western star. I want to play a different role. You want to know the reason many times sisters have been typecast? Part of the reason that many sisters have been typecast is because you continue to work for the same studio. If you're working for the devil... The only role he's going to have for you is one of those four roles. Because he knows that those four roles are helping to destroy African American communities. And the devil is about what? Stealing, killing, and destroying. Let me give her the role of a mammy because as long as she has the mammy role, she's going to help actually perpetuate the idea that black women are ugly. They're worthless, they're unimportant, and they can do nothing but serve somebody else. Let me actually give her the sapphire rule, because then if she has a sapphire rule, she's going to continue to emasculate men. And the man is actually going to say, you know what, I've had enough, and he's going to go somewhere else. Let me give her that Jezebel rule. Because then she'll have babies out of wedlock without a father. And these fatherless children are going to go up, grow up with messed up lives. The thing is, it's time, and, and hopefully not everybody's actually accepted the typecast role, but it's time that if you have, you stop working for that studio and stop working for a different film studio. You see, Jesus has a film studio. And he's looking for sisters to work in his film studio. <coughs> he's got a place for women in his work. Yeah. Proverbs 31 actually talks about it. Right. Proverbs 31. Go with me there. Proverbs yeah. chapter 31. Proverbs the 31st chapter. Proverbs chapter 31. The Bible says this. It says, who can find, verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above what? Rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days 
of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maid. And she considereth the field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planteth the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arm. I'm, I'm just going to stop there. But let's get, no, skip down to verse number 29. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord shall be, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. The Bible is essentially saying that God is actually willing to actually have women to actually work in his studio. And he's looking for virtuous women. He's looking for women who are willing to say, Lord, I won't be a Jezebel. Lord, I'm going to actually recognize my own worth, my self-worth in Christ Jesus. I won't be a mammy. Lord, I'm not going to be an angry black woman because why? I don't have to be angry because I, if I don't have a husband in this world, I have Jesus. Amen. What I like about, and begin to play, what I like about Mary Magdalene Is that Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene was was it was it first? She had been hired by the devil and typecast as a prostitute. Mary Magdalene, she was a prostitute. She was a Jezebel. We first read about her in. John the 8th chapter and where she's thrown at the feet of Jesus in her typecast role as a Jezebel. And she'd served it well. She served it so well until now she had been caught in the act, the very act of committing adultery. They said we caught this woman in the very act. Jesus didn't condemn her. The Bible says he actually wrote the sins of the actual accusers in the sand. So whosoever is without sin, let him first cast the stone. They all walked away. He said, go and sin no more. Ellen White says that she says that actually seven different times he had to continue to cast the demons out of Mary Magdalene. Why? Because she had been so, you hear me now, she had been so used to playing this typecast role of a Jezebel that it was so easy to go back to that same role. But Jesus cast the demons out seven different times. And then he actually hired her to be a part of his studio. She washed Jesus' feet. She used the best that she had to wash them. And then, when Jesus was in the grave, this former prostitute, now actually given a new role in Christ's film, she came to the tomb. She's searching for her master. She's searching for her Lord. Tears are flowing down her cheeks. She sees the gardener. She's, or so she thought. She said, 